Thank you so much, Dr. Williams, for giving us this interview. And can you tell us first a little bit about yourself and your background and what your current work is about? So I have a lot of backgrounds. The question is, <laughs> well, where would you like me to start? I'm from Chicago, um, grew up on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I was stimulated to go into medicine because there really wasn't a lot of good medical care access and I thought I could fix it by being a south side of Chicago pediatrician. <laughs> uh, as it turns out, um, you go to get a little older and find out that you have you know, sort of propensities and things mm -hmm. that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was cardiology. Okay. And um, so I thought that perhaps I could be a south side inner city cardiologist. And it turns out I was able to do that in an academic center for 30 years. I was at University of Chicago. So college medical school, most of my training uh, was there. Uh, and, and so you're trained in, I see a slew of degrees <laughs> here on the back wall. Can you tell us a little bit about your training too? So uh, yes, uh, I did internal medicine as a pathway to get to cardiology. Okay. Uh, once I was in cardiology, um, I, w I gravitated toward non-invasive imaging and uh, nuclear cardiology was a very early, uh, in the early stages of development back then. Um, I really adopted it and it adopted me, sort of and sucked me up in a vacuum and I sort of developed a laboratory at University of Chicago for uh, nuclear cardiology and I ran that for I think about 28 years before I became chief of cardiology at um, Wayne State uh, and then after th four years came over here to Rush. Okay, fantastic. And you are right now the current president of the American College of Cardiology. That's what correct. is that position about or what is that? So because the American College of Cardiology that. is uh, a, a really dynamic organization. The college has almost 50,000 members mm -hmm. and there are many international members. We actually have uh, local chapters in each of the states as well as Puerto Rico. But we also have uh, 34 international chapters as well. Our mission really is to improve heart health and transform cardiovascular care. Okay. So it, in, the, in the past, uh, folks sort of thought of the American College of Cardiologists mm -hmm. um, as sort of a trade organization mm -hmm. for you know, improving practice or income. or that, And nothing could be further from the truth. Like uh, we deal okay. with those issues uh, when they come up, but really not uh, so much from the lens of the uh, practitioner as much as the lens of the cardiovascular patient. Mm -hmm. And so we get involved with uh, advocacy, uh, teaching, research, uh, education is a, is a major issue for us. Um, we have the top cardiovascular journal in the world, that's the Jour Journal of the American College of Cardiology, mm -hmm. uh, with the impact factor which is uh, um, better than all the rest of them. We have um, the uh, registries, which are a, a major initiative started about 10 years ago by the ACC, where we really set out to try to measure quality and to thereby improve quality. Mm -hmm. And so the National Cardiovascular Data Registry, or NCDR, has multiple arms, outpatient, cath lab, uh, peripheral artery disease. There's so many different ways of uh, evaluating um, uh, practitioners and giving them feedback on how they're doing. And it's good to know if, if um, you know, if you're in a practice and your, your, your charts get reviewed and 50% of your patients who have a high LDL cholesterol or an indication for a statin aren't getting it, but, you know, and the rest of your practice is worse than you, you know, <laughs> it would be good to know that, right? Oh, yeah. And so we have a way of, uh, of making sure that people get the uh, information that they need to know. Okay, okay, fantastic, very, very good. And so, Dr. Will, you made national headlines with being a vegan cardiologist. Indeed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So you're vegan, how long have you been vegan, and what led to you following this diet? So it actually goes back to an ACC meeting uh, where back in the early 2000s, uh, we actually used to get our cholesterol tested, and it was mostly the statin uh, companies. At the meetings, would, they would test they would your actually cholesterol? test your cholesterol, oh, and fantastic. I, you know, had, I had done it. Maybe I'd skipped a year or two, but I'd done it pretty much regularly. And uh, the biggest change in my life was that I was no longer coaching a nationally ranked tennis player, so I wasn't playing tennis twice a day every day. Oh, wow. 
And um, I can't believe you were playing tennis twice a day at some <laughs> yeah, point. That really That's was. fantastic. Um, so yeah. you know, with that uh, change in exercise level and a little bit of aging, and maybe skipping a year or two, uh, I actually found out that my LDL cholesterol had gone up from, you know, not the best level, about 110 to 170. Now, all that time I was eating what was considered a heart-healthy diet, of chicken, fish, no red meat, no fried food, um, not much in the way of dairy, but little did I know mm -hmm. that I was one of those hyper-responders. And uh, if you look at the amount of cholesterol, not fat, but the cholesterol in a chicken breast, no skin, not fried, it's actually substantially more than a pork chop. And if you look at uh, fish, it completely varies by species. And so you might have a small amount of cholesterol in an anchovy, but I was eating a lot of salmon. Uh, salmon is very high in cholesterol uh, per serving. And so um, having had a little bit of information about the Dean Ornish diet, mostly because I'm a nuclear cardiologist and I had seen those publications on the improvement in blood flow with vegetarian diet, um, and I assumed that there was going to be some relation to, to cholesterol and removal of plaque because that pretty much had, had been published. Uh, and that same month, in March of 2003, there was a portfolio diet that came out in the Journal of American Medical Association talking about a plant-based diet that was equal to a statin in lowering LDL cholesterol and C-reactive protein. And so I adopted that pretty much that same day. Six weeks later, my LDL had gone down from 170 to 90. Well, that's amazing. Um, so I haven't knowingly eaten a milligram of cholesterol since then, but, you know. Good for you. Yeah. I found it myself didn't, uh, I was not really aware of that the lean meats and fish actually <laughs> contain a large amount of cholesterol, many of Correct. them. Correct. Do you find uh, that that's a common misperception amongst the public in general and amongst mm -hmm. other medical professionals? There really is a lot of misconception. Um, folks are thinking of uh, a heart healthy when they're talking about obesity. It's, it is important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is important. There's no question. Well, I'm sorry. I started to say there's no question about it. There is a question about it. There is the so-called obesity paradox. If you look at there are certain conditions where obese people actually do better. Um, it's counterintuitive for a cardiologist to think that way, mm -hmm. but it sort of emphasizes the difference between cholesterol management and risk affiliated with cholesterol management and weight. They are two separate conversations. Then you have to have the diabetic conversation and then the hypertension conversation. And they are really very, they're similar, um, and, but the similarity is that they can all be improved by plant-based nutrition. Okay. Uh, let me bring you up to the, the, the new things. I'll just make a brief list for you mm -hmm. of reasons that um, animal-based diets have difficulties. Probably one of the more interesting one is the TMAO. I'm not sure mm -hmm. you've heard that one. I have heard, but I'm not yeah, too familiar with it. Trimethylamine mm -hmm. oxide. Okay. So it turns out that there is a compound that you can measure in the bloodstream that if you divide people based on the level of this in their blood into four groups, you know, uh, low, medium low, medium high, and high. Mm -hmm. Those four groups do completely differently in both uh, uh, heart failure and the category of my car uh, heart attack, stroke, and death, mm -hmm. uh, cardiac death. Okay. And there are separate publications, you know, on, on this issue. So it's a good predictor. It's a really good predictor, predictor because okay. it's, it's more than just a risk factor, it actually is causative. That is, it does okay. blood vessel damage, creates mm. plaque, makes it more likely that the plaque's going to rupture, then you clot on top of that plaque and create an event, whether it's a stroke, heart attack, or amputation, and typically in a diabetic. It's like an inflammatory marker? Sort of. It's actually a damage vascular Damaging. pathic chemical. Okay. Okay? okay. So trimethylamine oxide. Okay, mm -hmm. so where does it come from? comes from the liver when the liver is presented with trimethylamine. Mm -hmm. Where does trimethylamine come from? It comes from the GI tract when bacteria convert phosphatidylcholine mostly into um, the uh, trimethylamine. Well, it turns out that if you have a species of bacteria that are slow converters, mm -hmm. you do better. If you wipe out, and they've done this at Cleveland Clinic, mm -hmm. um, in an animal model, you wipe out the bacteria that 
produce them and put in bacteria that don't produce a lot of trimethylam or, uh, trimethylamine, mm -hmm. you actually do better. Um, however, or in terms of lowering the tri trimethylamine oxide level. The other way is to be, gen be genetically gifted with a liver that very slowly converts trimethylamine to trimethylamine oxide. Okay. Okay. Um, but if you're a person who converts a lot of it, you're going to get a high level. Okay. Well, the other way to go about this, of course, to lower the level, to to lower get, the level yeah. would be to not eat the things that result in the phosphatidylcholine, which is basically the carnitine and the choline, and um, that comes from the diet. And so mainly what? Mainly animal meat, product? Meat. Okay. Egg, eggs, cheese, eggs. milk. Okay. And so if you all the avoid animal products and not animal byproducts, okay. Exactly. So if you avoid them, you probably could shunt by the, not, not worry about t taking a probiotic or antibiotic or you know, changing your liver enzymes or anything like that. And so that, that's some pretty strong evidence that, um, that we could use to try to convince people that plant-based nutrition would, on the basis of just that one compound. Unfortunately, there's loads of other compounds. You know, mm -hmm. We could talk about uh, cholesterol and oxidized LDL cholesterol, but that's sort of older stuff. The newer stuff, mm -hmm. how about phosphorus? Phosphorus. Phosphorus. If we it's all high measure, in animal products. If you, in absolutely. Milk, yeah, high in high in animal products, oh. low in vegetable products. If you measure phosphorus in a group of people who aren't on dialysis, mm -hmm. they're all about the same. Okay. Doesn't matter how much you eat, you get about the same level. Mm -hmm. Why do you get the same level? Because you have a regulatory hormone hormone called Calcium. FGF twenty three, mm -hmm. fibroblast fibroblast growth factor twenty three. It turns out that FGF23, it will go up if you eat a lot of phosphorus, it'll go down if you don't eat much, and it'll keep you perfectly regulated in your phosphorus level. The problem is, mm -hmm. FGF23 is vasculotoxic, <laughs> okay? Oh, no. And so, you end up with this hormone that creates hypertrophy of the ventricle and is associated with heart attacks and sudden death and heart failure. Similar to TMAO. Okay. okay. So more problematic compound. Right. So how would you lower that? Just lower the phosphorus in 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 the diet. Uh, tremendous. Now. And that would be decreasing animal products or avoiding be, animal products. That's right. Meat, more dairy, eggs, fish. More fruit and vegetables, high fiber, should lower your phosphorus levels. Okay. 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 Fantastic. So anyway, you know, we could look at it from uh, several biochemical points of view. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it may be that vegetables aren't really good for you, but animals are terrible for you. <laughs> that okay. could be what it is, and that's so. When when you people talk about the F and V, you know, the fruits and vegetable um, campaign uh, mm -hmm. that I know the White House is taking up, it really does make a difference. And it, it, there there probably are some really good things about the, the vegetables and fruits mm -hmm. in terms of some everything. Of them which from we don't even know about. Correct, right? and so it's okay. it's. You know, it's it's antioxidants and it's vitamins and it's nutrients and and uh, fiber. That may be all well and good, but it might just be that the animals are so bad for you that in no, eating anything else that could nutrify you without eating an animal um, is probably going to show up better. Um, so, you know, not the biggest fan of being a pescatarian based on the Seventh Day Adventist data, mm -hmm. which says that it's sort of an intermediate outcome between the standard American diet and a vegan diet, but if you could lower your heart attack rate just by eating fish twice a week and getting away from red meat, that's sort of how tells you how toxic it is. And so, um, you know. But the optimum diet that you would recommend. Correct. Um, given right. the prevalence of mercury and given the prevalence of, you know, cholesterol within the fishes as well. Or right. even if it was a fish that had no uh, mercury, a completely clean uh, fish with no DDT or mercury, the optimal diet that you think uh, would provide optimum nutrition and health would be a diet with uh, sure. What? And uh, you know, the, so there are good reasons that a pescatarian diet is better than uh, omniv um, omnivore diet. So pescatarian is better than omnivore. Okay. But uh, um, but a vegetarian diet is better than pescatarian because you're not getting, you know, with, with fish you mentioned uh, mercury, but it's also PCBs, mm -hmm. uh, there's saturated fat, there's cholesterol, and so, and, you so know, So vegetarian as well as you would classify as better than pescatarian? By far. 
but still a diet with uh, a vegan diet, a plant-based vegan diet, mm -hmm. which would not include any uh, dairy. dairy or eggs, right. would be kind of the gold standard if somebody was willing to, that to is do it. Very, very well said. Uh, that's been published from the Seventh-day Adventists where they categorize their population into five categories, the standard American, the semi-vegetarian, where they just, they eat everything, they just lower the amount of eat and, uh, meat and increase the amount of vegetables. You can see about a 15 to 20 percent decrease in hypertension and diabetes just by doing that. And then if you go pescatarian, you get another 15 to 20 percent decrease. Uh, and then if you go um, lacto-ovo vegetarian, you get another 15 to 20 percent. Uh, and then if you go vegan, you're really talking about an 80, 75 to 80 percent decrease in hypertension and diabetes. Fantastic. Indeed. And um, I read that Dr. David Spence in Canada, he was, uh, he and two other academics, I don't remember, Dr. Jenkins I think was the other one, and mm -hmm. they were advocating for a limit of cholesterol of 200 milligrams daily, and they were saying that a single egg, I guess a large egg, would contain more than 200 milligrams of cholesterol. It's about 240. 240, and mm -hmm. so they were advocating, and they were saying that eggs should be eaten only for people, the way that they framed it was only for people with terminal illness, because <laughs> of course that did not go over easy with okay. the egg board, but what they were making a point is that everybody's at risk for cardiovascular disease. Right. We are all at risk, and so right now the limits say that 200 milligrams is what people who are at risk uh, for cardiovascular disease should be sticking to. And they said, well, we're all at risk for it, so we should all not eat eggs and keep our cholesterol limit um, low. So I guess that's a kind of a battleground right now, I'm sure, with uh, the cholesterol intake and what we need to keep it under. Yeah, so I'm that's, sure it must be right now difficult. That's, that's interesting. Um, I, I would say um, congratulations to them. I do worry about the 200 for because we do know that there's an inverse relationship between the absorption and the amount that you're eating. So when you get to the lower levels, you're probably going to hyperabsorb more. So, so that's one thing. The other thing is that um, you know I talked about um, TMAO and phosphorus and cholesterol. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk about IGF-1, insulin-like growth, growth factor yeah. one. And so I, I, I am a little concerned about eating the animal protein. Um, in that, general? In general. Be it eggs, fish, for, exactly. skinless chicken, anything. Right, uh -huh. because of the IGF-1 levels that have been associated with cancer growth. And so if you're terminal, I guess that's what, if, you, if, if people say, well, I have cancer, so it's okay, that probably isn't the right thing to do. You're right. There's loads of anecdotes. I would love to see a randomized trial, but, but enough powerful anecdotes that of people I've known personally and people I've known, you know, uh, where it happened to a family member there, that somebody gets to the cancer patient and tells them, oh, you've got to go vegan, it's going to help you. Mm -hmm. They lose weight. They uh, have what appears to be stabilization of their disease. And the oncologist will say, see the weight loss and say, you have to eat more, eat some steaks and stuff like that. And then the disease runs rampant. Um, so I, you know, I was, uh, I was always worried about, um, you know, not getting a, the animal protein. So I, uh, until this, the movie Forks Over Knives came out, mm -hmm. um, I wasn't absolutely vegan. I was eating zero cholesterol. Okay, uh, which meant that I was eating egg whites. Egg whites. Uh, and once I saw that data, I kind of stopped and uh, said. Let's it's pretty take a, compelling data yeah, that he has it was, done. It was. He kind of can make cancer uh, growth Correct. go up and down depending on the animal protein that they feed them. Exactly. Yeah. And it turns out mm -hmm. uh, that that was subsequently published in Cell Metabolism in 2013. Um, so I, you know, if it's, if it's truly peer reviewed evidence, mm -hmm. I'm not going to eat it. So. Okay. So mm -hmm. best to stay away from I think animal so. products and just invest in plant based vegan. Um, can you speak to us a little bit about, oh, we have very little time remaining, about the ubiquitousness of cardiovascular disease? I read some studies that they did autopsies on soldiers, in uh, American soldiers um, who were in the battlefield in Korea, and some studies here in the U.S. 
people who died from non-medical, I mean, yeah, from like accidents or suicide or homicide, non-medical related causes. And it seems like atherosclerosis is pretty ubiquitous on a Western culture with animal products. Can you tell us a little bit about that, just in general? So this is, has been, as you mentioned, a well-known mm -hmm. phenomenon. <coughs> um, the distressing feature, you know, we knew this about Korea, and those are 18-year-olds dying on the battlefield mm -hmm. uh, where they were able to see fatty streaks in the aorta, uh, early plaque development yeah, on a Western diet. Uh, I've heard reports that, you know, that uh, in, with, in more modern studies that it goes down to the age of three where mm -hmm. folks have actually seen plaque developing. Um, my, my concern, of course, is that uh, we have so much plaque and it isn't necessarily recognized. Um, the best sort of uh, reconciliation of that was actually uh, done about, whoa, 20 years ago, 1995, by uh, Steve Nissen at Cleveland Clinic doing intravascular ultrasound on the arteries of people who had donated their hearts for transplant motor vehicle accidents, people like you said. Mm -hmm. And in order to donate your heart, you have to have an angiogram that shows no atherosclerosis, no plaque. Mm -hmm. And so the coronary angiograms were completely normal on these people, mm -hmm. but Steve actually did intracoronary ultrasound, okay? Intravascular ultrasound inside the coronary, coronary arteries and showed an increasing relationship between the amount of plaque that's not seen by the angiogram, which was considered until then to be the gold standard. Mm -hmm. uh, not seen by the angiogram and related to age and smoking and gender. Mm -hmm. And so that, pub that was published in circulation. It, I think it, it should have affected most of us because we had actually heard about this, the so-called Glagoff phenomenon. Uh, Seymour Glagoff was my pathology instructor at at University of Chicago okay. and in 1987 he published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine describing how you start off with a normal artery and then over time with the Western diet you develop plaque. The artery on the inside does not change but you develop plaque in the wall mm -hmm. and the artery expands to accept that plaque so that the lumen does not change. That happens you, when you get to the moderate level. You could have a massive amount of plaque out here, okay, mm -hmm. in the wall. External remodeling. The Glagoff remodeling hy hypothesis, as he called it, but it's not a hypothesis mm -hmm. anymore, it's been very well proven, um, is that you will, you will accumulate plaque in the wall and remodel the artery outward until you overcome the ability of the artery to dilate up and take more plaque and then and only then you start to get a narrowing. So the problem that we've had, as Steve Nissen pointed out mm -hmm. eight years later, is that we under recognize plaque with uh, the plaque burden using angiograms and so we need some other way of going about it. Now it turns out that uh, non-invasive imaging with CT doesn't require you know, like an angiogram like mm -hmm. one would do with mm -hmm. intracoronary ultrasound. And one can look at soft plaque in the wall okay. with a technique such as like that, such as that. The real implication though is about our everyday patient who um, is told, oh, you had a narrowing in one of your arteries, <clears throat> it's mild, 30% narrowing, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not okay. <laughs> They have a massive amount of plaque burden, uh, uh, which has overcome the ability of the artery to remodel outward. And, and if they have it there, they probably have problems all over their body. Correct. And so not only in that one location, I mean, there is some variability in the amount of plaque that happens in each location. The aorta, for example, up around the aortic arch. Um, tends to have a lot of plaque in one spot. We see that all the time on CT. Mm -hmm. The abdominal aorta tends to have a lot. There are a couple of arteries that rarely, if ever, get plaque. Radial arteries and uh, internal thoracic arteries. Okay. That's the reason that the bypass surgery is usually done with those arteries, they okay? because they just don't develop plaque. Okay. But everything else, 
tends has to plan. develop. Exactly. Um, and so when you see that coronary narrowing of 30%, the message ha has to be, you're not okay. Mm -hmm. You have a massive plaque burden. I don't need to put an, a stent over this little piece of it right now, mm -hmm. but we need to change all of the dynamics that got that plaque to be there. That's diet, exercise, high dose statin. Mm -hmm. We need to be concerned. I always tell my patients with the little 10 to 20% narrowings and they think they're okay, I'm telling them, are you left-handed or right-handed? <laughs> most people are right-handed. I say, You're, as far as I'm concerned, the most important artery is not the one we're looking at, it's the left carotid. The left carotid. Because if you have a stroke, that really changes your life completely. Okay. And so why, uh, why worry about one little tiny piece of plaque when it's really a global phenomenon that has to be dealt with in a global fashion. Okay, definitely, definitely. And just, I know that uh, we're coming close to the end, but um, you have an upcoming talk that's gonna be called Nutrition, the Future of Cardiology, or something to that effect. Do you feel like this would be a very effective intervention uh, and to unburden the healthcare system to transition to a plant-based vegan diet? So I, I've made a few controversial statements during okay. my presidency okay. <laughs> and before. One of them was that wouldn't it be nice within a couple of generations to you know, eliminate our specialty. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say that half-jokingly, mm -hmm. um, but we could make some strides. Mm -hmm. And I really applaud uh, my colleagues at the American College of Cardiology, particularly the Prevention Committee, uh, and the Population Health Committee for working on ways of trying to make the health of the population better. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've also, I, I also have uh, uh, the, the patients who say that they're not going to take statins. Mm -hmm. You know, I have the ones who say they're not going to do diet. Uh, the ones who say, mm -hmm. you know, they say I'm not going to take statins because the side effect profile is just so terrible and it's going to do terrible things. I say, you know, the biggest side effect of statins is ruining the Medicare budget because people aren't dead, <laughs> but they're not well either, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a, a economic problem that's not st sustainable. Mm -hmm. So we have to get into the prevention. We have to become better at turning off the faucet rather than mopping up the floor. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, diet op and exercise and um, can weight control having people understand what their blood pressure is, what their cholesterol is, and actively keeping that front of brain and working on health issues has to become very, a, form, uh, a foremost uh, function of what we do in medicine. Much more prevention um, so that we don't have to do as much treatment in the future. I completely agree. And let me just get your thoughts. So Kaiser Permanente published in their medical journal. More research is needed to find ways to make plant-based diet the new normal for our patients and employees. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I fundamentally agree with that, um, but it, it, it comes off as if there isn't a good database already. There actually is a pretty solid uh, literature foundation, but what I'm looking for and what they're looking for mm -hmm are randomized trials that are come to the level of evidence that all of the guideline committees would say, okay, it's self-evident, this is something that we all need to do. And we haven't quite gotten there yet. But it's so hard to do though, like a is. randomized trial when it comes to diet, mm -hmm. because the problem is people are, you know, I think that when it comes to nutrition, we don't really do those trials, right? Because it's not like we have like a matrix where you have people where we feed them every day for long periods of time and we know exactly what they took and what they did. What you just said is, how do you do credible research and diet on free living populations? Well, one is to not let them live free, but that's not going to happen that's in this not country. Happen. Uh, there, there actually was one person who did this, uh, the Kempner Warner uh, Kempner diet uh, back in the 30s and 40s, and I think it's, that institute stayed open for a long time. And there was un one unfortunate accusation that he had, uh, you know, abused a patient to make sure that they stayed on the rice diet. But that's not something that's that we do. That's not something that we would want to do. Um, and so what we, what we have to do is trials such as people who are willing to do it, which may be a selection bias right there, um, uh, and do sim similar to the PREDIMED trial, where you've got uh, randomization between a Mediterranean diet and a standard American diet. 
Um, it actually did show an improvement, even though it contained fish and uh, lean, you know, small amounts of lean meat. Um, we think we can do better than the residual risk that we saw in the PREDIMED trials, but you have to be able to, to conduct those kind of trials. We do have, you know, uh, ob you know, where you randomize people or self-randomize, then that's sort of what happened with Dean Orner. So recruit people and you have the one-third of the group that, re that does exactly everything you say, one-third of the group that does it halfway and the other group that doesn't do it. And so we divide them into three groups based on their compliance. Um, and those are very convincing, but they're not exactly randomized. And so the, you know, the, tr the trialists end up throwing them out. So it is a challenge, and uh, I know there are some, um, you know, we're making some headway in, in small populations here and there where folks are able to do these things for, you know, relatively short periods of time. Um, but, yeah, I understand it's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. It's not a but put in context with all the information that we have, uh, I think that we have, uh, you know, substantial information to, you know, recommend as physicians right. that does the best diet for optimum health and nutrition. I, I think that's a, mm -hmm. that's a good summary statement. Is it enough to get into the guidelines? And we normally do very guideline-driven oh, right. practice. You're, you're talking about guidelines, um, yeah. I think most people would agree mm -hmm. um, that the sum of the literature would be that as far as you're capable of going is where you should go and towards plant-based nutrition, uh, particularly if you are uh, have cardiovascular disease, a variety of cardiovascular diseases, and a lot of non-cardiac diseases. Um, there may be some portion of the population, the cholesterol non-responders, the people uh, who have um, uh, mutations, uh, non-function mutations of the PCSK9 uh, gene, they come to mind. They could probably eat whatever they want and have an LDL cholesterol of seven or fourteen, mm -hmm. and um, you know. So there are people. It's a minority. <laughs> yeah, there are some people who probably uh -huh. could get away with eating. That's you know not a good business model if you're you know in a barbecue chain is to depend on the people who will not be harmed by it. Mm -hmm. um, that's you know uh, not not the best situation, but you know I, I understand that uh, it's difficult to change people's diets. Um, they hold their dietary beliefs are. Um, as deep as religious beliefs, and uh, sometimes it takes a a major scare, scare or uh, illness to uh, convince people that they should change any of their habits, uh, including diet. Dr. William C. Roberts, you're familiar with him, another mm -hmm. prominent cardiologist and cardiovascular pathologist, wrote the following, and I just want to get your thoughts on it. He read. Although most of us conduct our lives as omnivores in that we eat flesh as well as vegetables and fruits, human beings have characteristics of herbivores, not carnivores. The appendages of carnivores are claws, those of herbivores are hands or hooves. The teeth of carnivores are sharp, those of herbivores are mainly flat for grinding. The intestinal tract of carnivores is short, that of herbivores long. Body cooling of carnivores is done by panting, herbivores by sweating. Carnivores drink fluids by lapping, herbivores by sipping. Carnivores produce their own vitamin C, whereas herbivores obtain it from their diet. Thus, humans have characteristics of herbivores, not carnivores. And he also writes, atherosclerosis affects only herbivores. Dogs, cats, tigers, and lions can be saturated with fat and cholesterol, and atherosclerotic plagues do not develop. Have any thoughts on Agree completely. On that? Agree? <laughs> yeah, of course, I, Bill, Bill Roberts, I consider him a friend. I got to hear him speak, I think, week, last weekend before we were on a program together. There's good evidence that uh, plant-based nutrition is, is the best for you. You know what, we're kind of more suited to digest and to develop, to... Chew. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. a good point about the teeth. Excellent. Well, right. thank you so much, Dr. Williams. My pleasure. <laughs>